So want to really get China like beyond the headlines. Mm -hmm. Yeah, me too. Especially these days with China's, well, you know, global presence, mm -hmm. getting a grip on their history. It just feels like essential. Absolutely. And that's where Linda Jabin's The Shortest History of China comes in. Mm -hmm. And look, I'm all for a good doorstop of a history book. Oh, me too. But this one, refreshingly concise, but still, like, seriously engaging. It's true. She's got a knack for capturing those big historical arcs without, you know, getting lost in the weeds. Exactly. No one wants a lecture. We're going for those, like, mind-blown connections, those aha moments. You know, those takeaways you actually remember. Exactly. And I think there's no better place to start, if you'll indulge me for a moment. Go for it. Then, with this image of Peking Man almost a million years ago, imagine coexisting with these wild animals right where Beijing is now. It's almost impossible to imagine, right? Yeah. Like, what would those early humans think of, you know, the megatessity it's become? It really drives home, I think, the sheer scope of Chinese history, and it lays the groundwork for these foundational figures, almost mythical in a way, like the Yellow Emperor and the Shia Dynasty. Right. And these aren't just stories, right? They're woven into Chinese identity, giving the Han Chinese this shared ancestry, even if those early origins are, well, let's say, a bit murky. It's like those founding myths you find in every culture. Yeah. Romulus and Remus, King Arthur, shaping national identity, even if historians might um, debate the details. Exactly. And speaking of evidence, things get really interesting with the Shang Dynasty. We're talking around 1600 BCE. We move from myth to something tangible. Oracle bones. Okay, oracle bones. Yes, imagine. Inscribed tortoise shells, ox bones. They use them for divination. Asking about everything from, you know, harvests to battle. Uh, so it's like we have a window into their anxieties, their hopes, <laughs> right? We're not just talking pings and dates anymore, but how they actually lived. And get this, those inscriptions, mm. the earliest known examples of Chinese writing. Wow. I mean, it's incredible to think about it. This incredibly complex system of communication, one that would influence, well, so much of East Asia, and it has its roots in these oracle bones, these like whispered questions to the gods. A direct line to the past. And it's around this time, right, that we see the rise of the Zhu dynasty. And this concept that, well, it pops up again and again, the mandate of heaven. Oh, absolutely. It echoes through all of Chinese history. It's this idea that a ruler's legitimacy comes from, you know, a divine source. But, and this is crucial, that mandate wasn't unconditional. Right. It wasn't just a free pass. Right. If a ruler was corrupt, ineffective, they risked losing it. And that could mean rebellion, a new dynasty rising. Okay, so it's not just about like being born the chosen one, there's actual accountability built in. Exactly. Sure. And a great example of this is the Duke of Zhu. He ruled as regent, you know, early Zhu dynasty. Yeah. He became this model of a virtuous ruler, peace, stability, wise governance. It set a standard that later rulers were constantly measured against. So he's like the prototype, right? Like Confucian ideal, even before, well, Confucius. Ah. Sorry, I can't. And speaking of Confucius, the Zhu dynasty was this incredibly fertile time for ideas. Think about it. While, say, Buddha and Socrates are challenging traditional thinking in other parts of the world, China's having its own philosophical revolution brewing. It's like a philosophical battle royale. Oh, okay. Okay. But let, let's start with Confucius. He was all about education, ritual, moral leadership, basically, the recipe for a harmonious society. Right. Exactly. But, and this is important, he wasn't content to just, you know, theorize. He was an activist, traveling from state to state, looking for a ruler who would actually put his ideas into practice. So he was like on this lifelong quest to find a leader who lived up to his ideals. Exactly. It shows how deeply he believed in this vision of a better world. Talk about commitment. But then you have Taoism, which seems to offer, well, a, a very different past. This idea of harmonizing with the natural order, the Tao it's like they're responding to the same issues, but with totally different solutions. And at the heart of that is Laozi, the author of the Tao Te Ching. Okay, now Laozi, he's an interesting character. He is. We know so little about him for sure. Even the Tao Te Ching itself shrouded in mystery. Those chapters weren't even compiled in a fixed order until centuries later. He's like the philosophical ninja leaving behind this incredibly influential work and then poof, vanishing into the mist. Right. But what we do know is this. Laozi's teachings center around Wu, often translated as like non-action, but it's a lot more subtle than that. It's not about just like doing nothing. It's more about acting effortlessly in tune with the natural order. Right. Exactly. He uses this metaphor of water. 
Water wends its way gently round every obstacle, avoids height, sinks to depths, bends with curves, fills and pours, fits into square and circle, into small and great. Okay, yeah, I see what you mean. It's about yielding, adapting, not meeting force with force. It's a powerful image, yeah. especially in a world that often seems obsessed with, you know, just pushing harder no matter what. Right. And then, of course, you have Zhuangzi who comes along and adds his own, let's just say, colorful spin on Taoism. Okay, Zhuangzi. He loved a good story, an anecdote, like that famous butterfly dream. Have you heard of this one? I think so. Refresh my memory. So Zhuangzi dreams he's a butterfly, flitting around, totally carefree. He wakes up and he's like, wait, am I Zhuangzi who dreamt he was a butterfly or a butterfly dreaming he's Zhuangzi? It raises these questions about reality, perception, What's real? What's a dream? It's enough to make your head spin a bit. Right. But look, as if Confucianism and Taoism weren't enough, you also have legalism popping up around this time. And this is a philosophy that takes a much more, shall we say, pragmatic approach. <laughs> Some might say ruthless. Oh, okay. Tell me more about that. So if Confucianism is all about moral persuasion and Taoism is about, you know, harmonizing with nature, legalism is about order, strict laws, harsh punishments. The kind of the opposite end of the spectrum. In many ways, yes. And it's an idea that would have a big influence on later Chinese rulers, especially those obsessed with centralizing power control. So here you have it. Confucianism, Taoism, legalism, three different answers to the question of how to live, how to govern. And all this is happening as the Zhu dynasty weakens, China just descends into, you know, warring states. And it's from those ashes that the Qin dynasty rises, a pivotal moment. After centuries of division, China is unified under Qin Shi Huang, the first emperor. And this guy, this guy was something else. But we'll have to save his story for next time on, well, the deep dive. Welcome back to our deep dive. Last time we left off with, well, this Zhu dynasty kind of falling apart, right? Setting the stage for the Qin dynasty. And at the center of it all, Qin Shi Huang, the first emperor. What a way to make an entrance, huh? Unifies China after, what, centuries of division? But he was also known for, let's say, his uh, assertive style. Yeah, definitely not afraid to uh, ruffle a few feathers to get things done. But seriously, Qin Shi Huang's reign, it's really a study in contrast. Right. On the one hand, you've got this visionary leader, standardized weights and measures, unified currency, stuff we take for granted now. But back then, revolutionary. It's like he created the foundation for an economically unified China. Exactly. It's like those early Roman emperors, right. you know, bringing order to the chaos. But then there's the other side. The burning books, burying scholars, not exactly uh, enlightened behavior. Yeah, not a good look. It speaks to this tension that runs through so much of Chinese history, the pull between like central authority and intellectual freedom. Qin Shi Huang wanted a unified China, sure, but on his terms. Total control, not just of land, but of thought itself. A good reminder that, you know, progress isn't always a straight line. And yeah. even the most visionary leaders, well, sometimes they can have this ruthless streak. Absolutely. And you know what they say about empires built on force. Well, they'll last long. Exactly. Right. The Qin Dynasty, what, 15 years? Kind of says it all. It makes you think about that old saying, you can conquer by force, but you can only rule by winning hearts and minds. And that takes us to the Han Dynasty, which, well, they seem to learn from the Qin's mistakes. They ushered in what a lot of people consider a golden age. Right. It's like a total U-turn. We go yeah. from the Iron Fist to this era of peace, prosperity, incredible culture. I mean, we're talking about the invention of paper. Oh, yeah. The seismometer, yeah. acupuncture, even early forms of anesthesia, the Han Dynasty. It's amazing how much we owe to that period. It's mind-blowing. It was just this incredible period of, you know, intellectual and technological advancement. And what's so interesting is that Emperor Wudi, one of the key figures of the Han, he recognized the importance of, well, let's call it soft power. He really embraced Confucianism as this guiding principle. So smart. After the Qin Dynasty's harshness. Exactly. It was strategic, right? Promoting harmony, stability. It makes you wonder, though, did Emperor Wudi actually believe in all that Confucian stuff? Or is it just like... A really savvy power play. That's the million dollar question, isn't it? Historians are still debating that. Probably a bit of both, right? Right. But whatever his reasons were, the impact was huge. I mean, it shaped Chinese bureaucracy, their social values for centuries. And then, of course, there's the Silk Road. That emerges during this time. Ah, the Silk Road. Talk about yeah. globalization, right? East and West, all these goods, ideas, religions flowing back and forth, Buddhism even. It wasn't just about, you know, silks and spices. It was knowledge, 
philosophies, artistic influences, you can see the impact, like the echoes of that exchange and everything from Tang Dynasty art to, like you said, the spread of Buddhism throughout Asia. The Han Dynasty's legacy, it wasn't just about what happened within China's borders. It's about China's place in the world. Exactly. And it shows just how interconnected the world has always been, even back then. Right. But like all golden ages, the Han eventually, well, it faded, corruption, economic troubles, pressure from nomadic tribes. It's a familiar story, unfortunately. It's like the classic recipe for even the most successful empires to crumble. Internal decay, external pressure. And it's a pattern we see again and again in Chinese history, don't we? Over and over. It's cyclical. These periods of unity, then fragmentation. And so after the Han, China goes through another one of those periods of disunity. You have the Three Kingdoms period, this era of intense rivalry, warfare, it's the stuff of legends, actually. Like Game of Thrones, but ancient China. Exactly. Yeah. And it just shows the power of a good story, right? Even these chaotic, violent times, they get romanticized, turned into these epic tales of, like, heroism, betrayal, the romance of the Three Kingdoms. I mean, that's a classic for a reason. Political intrigue, battles, these larger-than-life characters who wouldn't be fascinated. Right. But eventually, things settle down. China's reunified again, this time under the Sui Dynasty. And they really went big on the whole, like infrastructure thing, right? Mm -hmm. That's when they built the Grand Canal. Exactly. Incredible feat of engineering, connecting the North and South, like jump-starting trade, communication, everything. It's mind-blowing when you think about the scale of that project. Yeah. I mean, no modern technology. What a legacy, huh? Right. But like you said, Chinese history, it's all about cycles. The Sui, they were pretty short-lived, but from their ashes, another golden age rises the Tang Dynasty. And if the Han Dynasty was all about the rise of Confucianism, the Tang, they took it to a whole other level. And the Tang Dynasty, the 618 to 907 CE, if I'm remembering correctly. You got it. Okay, good. But this period, it was more than just like politically stable. This is peak cultural brilliance, economic prosperity. It was cosmopolitan, open to all these influences from the Silk Road. You see it in their art, architecture, their poetry. Speaking of which, we can't talk about the Tang Dynasty without mentioning Li Bai, can we? Oh, he's the best. One of China's greatest poets. He wrote about nature, freedom, how short life is. There's that line, you know, from Drinking Alone by Moonlight. Something like, I raise my glass and invite the bright moon to join me in my solitary feast with my shadow. We make three. It's beautiful, isn't it? It's amazing. And a little melancholy, too. Totally. His writing, it just captures that feeling of like how quickly time passes. And it's something that people connected to then and we still connect to it now. It's timeless. Exactly. But the Tang Dynasty wasn't just about poetry, of course. This was also a golden age for calligraphy, painting, music. It was like this incredible explosion of creativity. So what happened? What brought down the mighty Tang Dynasty? They had it all. Back again. On our deep dive into Chinese history. And last time, if you remember, we were like up to our eyeballs in Tang Dynasty awesomeness. Poets, artists, those cosmopolitan cities. But, well, we've seen this pattern before, even the best of times. Don't last forever. Exactly. So what happened next? Well, the Tang Dynasty, they didn't just suddenly collapse. It was more like a slow decline. Internal rebellions, economic woes, pressure from those nomadic groups always hanging around on the borders. It all adds up. And eventually China's fragmented again. Chaos, competing kingdoms, the whole nine yards. But then, from that mess, the Song Dynasty rises. They pick up the pieces, you know, and start to build something new. And it wasn't just about, like, getting back to some lost glory, right? The Song, they had their own thing going on. Yeah. Innovation, tech, even how they ran things. Oh, totally. The Song Dynasty, they were all about pushing boundaries. Think gunpowder, the compass, shipbuilding techniques that were, like, way ahead of their time, and maybe the most important of all, the development of printing. Wait, printing? Like, before <laughs> Gutenberg? Seriously. That just blows my mind. We really do have a very Eurocentric view of history, don't we? We do. Just imagine the impact, though. Knowledge spreading, literature, ideas, all because of that one innovation. It was massive. Chinese culture, education, everyday life, it all changed because of printing. And economically, the Song Dynasty was booming. Cities like Hangzhou, their capital, they weren't just political centers. There were these thriving hubs of commerce, culture, sophistication. Some historians even argue they were more advanced than European cities at the time. It's wild to picture, right? Those bustling markets, the sheer amount of stuff and ideas changing hands. It's not the isolated, static East we often imagine, is it? It certainly isn't. And it reminds us that globalization, it's not some new thing. It's been happening for 
like forever. So what went wrong? It sounds like they had it figured out. Well, you know, the usual suspects, unfortunately. Internal divisions, the economy, external pressure, the Song Dynasty, they had to deal with all of that. And eventually, well, they ran into Kublai Khan and the Mongols. Oh, right, right, the Mongols. Like a force of nature, weren't they? Just sweeping across Asia, changing everything. So what happens when you have these nomadic warriors conquering, like a sophisticated empire like the yeah. Song? It's a culture clash on an epic scale. It was, but it wasn't just about, you know, destruction and conquest. Kublai Khan, he gets a bad rap. He was a brilliant military strategist, sure. But he also understood that to rule effectively, he needed to adapt. So he establishes the Yuan Dynasty, the first foreign dynasty to rule all of China. And he incorporates Chinese traditions, administration, even though the Mongols kept their own distinct identity. A bit more savvy than the Qin Dynasty's approach, huh? Sounds like a real cultural fusion. It was. And it wasn't just about conflict and adaptation either. This was also a time of incredible exchange. Think about Marco Polo, right? His travels through the Yuan Dynasty, they gave Europeans their first real look at China, its wealth, its diversity, its achievement. He was like the original travel blogger. Right. And even though his writings are uh, a bit romanticized, they had a huge impact on how the West saw the East for centuries. But as we've seen time and time again, dynasties, they don't last forever. And eventually, the Yuan Dynasty, they faced resistance. The Han Chinese, they wanted to return to, you know, traditional rule. And that's how the Ming Dynasty comes in, founded by Hong Wu, who it's kind of an amazing story, actually. He started as a peasant and rose to become emperor. Talk about an underdog story. <laughs> it goes to show, I guess, that in Chinese history, no one's safe. Empires can fall, even the mighty ones. So the Ming Dynasty, what were they all about? How do they, like, make their mark after the Mongols? Well, the early Ming, that was a time of expansion, cultural revival, all of that. Under the Yongle Emperor, you see the construction of the Forbidden City, that iconic symbol of imperial power, and the Great Wall as we know it today. Much of that was built and fortified during this time. But their most ambitious project, the one that really makes you go, wow, were the voyages led by Zheng He. Oh, yeah, Zheng He. Yeah. Now, those were some expeditions decades before Columbus, right? He's leading these huge fleets across the Indian Ocean, going all the way to Africa, setting up these incredible trade networks. So why don't we hear more about him? It's a great question, and one historians are still debating. Why did the Ming suddenly stop those voyages? Probably a combination of things. Politics, the cost, a shift towards a more inward focus within the Ming court. It's one of those big what-if moments in history, isn't it? What if they'd kept going? I know, right? The world might be a very different place. But even without those expeditions, the Ming Dynasty, they left their mark. Art, literature, porcelain production, some of China's finest work comes from this period. But, well, you know the drill by now. Corruption, economic instability, pressure from outside, it all weakens the Ming, and they're eventually overthrown, this time by the Manchus, another group from outside the traditional Chinese heartland. The cycle continues. And with the Manchus, <laughs> we enter the last dynasty in Chinese history. The Qing Dynasty. Right. And the Qing Dynasty, even with dealing with their own share of, you know, rebellions and threats, they managed to stay in power for a surprisingly long time. They even expanded their territory quite a bit, especially during the reigns of emperors like Kangxi and Qianlong. It was a dynasty that balanced big ambitions with a more practical approach to ruling. But this is also when China has that first, I don't know, really jarring encounter with the West, isn't it? It's not just about trade and cultural exchange anymore. It's about power. Yeah. The Opium Wars in the mid-1800s, those were a turning point. China, dealing with internal struggles facing the British military. The Qing Dynasty was forced to sign these unequal treaties. They had to cede Hong Kong, open up more treaty ports, give foreigners all these special rights. And that period, from the Opium Wars to when the Qing Dynasty finally falls in 1912, it's often called China's century of humiliation. It left a real scar. So, yeah, China's story, it's not just about these internal cycles, is it? It's about their place in a world that's changing fast, a world where other powers want to dominate. Exactly. And that desire to, I don't know, to regain their footing, to not be pushed around, it really shapes China in the 20th century. But that's a story for another deep dive. Another time. Wow, we've covered a lot of ground. From, like, Peking Man hanging out with prehistoric beasts to the fall of the last dynasty, <laughs> empires rising and falling, amazing innovations, a civilization trying to figure out its place in a world that's constantly changing. And this was just a taste. There's so much more to explore in Chinese history. And what's even more incredible, it's a story that's still being written. Right. 
It's not just dates and names in a textbook. It's very much alive. Absolutely. And if you've been as uh, captivated as I have been by this deep dive, you should definitely check out the book, The Shortest History of China by Linder Javen. It's a great read. It really is. It's amazing how this ancient civilization, it still impacts us today. You can see those echoes everywhere. It makes you realize history isn't just something in the past, you know? Mm -hmm. It's a way to understand the world, maybe even ourselves, a little better. So much to think about. Well, that's it for today's Deep Dive. We'll be back soon with more fascinating stories from history.